Welcome to Deepen with Pastor Joby Martin. The Church of 1122 is a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're praying this message helps you deepen your relationship with Him. Now let's dive in. Well, welcome back to the Deepen Podcast with Pastor Joby Martin. Uh, You guys, almost a year ago, we sat down. You had written your first book, If the Tomb is Empty, And our church walked through a sermon series and we did a podcast. And now we get to come back one year later with Anything is Possible. Number two, Joby Martin with Charles Martin. Is it crazy to see your name on a book again? A little bit, yeah. (laughs) Um, And we get to do it again. We get to sit for nine weeks. I'm so excited for the three of us to just sit down and walk through each chapter I don't really care if anyone got anything out of the last one last year because it was so good for my soul. I feel like I was just being publicly discipled throughout the series. So um, I'm just so excited. And how has it been so far? I mean, the book released March 20th. So it's been out for two weeks now. How has it been so far? Uh, It's really been great. Um, I am primarily a pastor, not primarily an author. So the things that, that touch me are the life change stories that we already hear about people that are reading it and how it impacts them. You know, one of the things from If the Tomb is Empty is a kid that I knew from Dylan named Jess Beal, who's now a grown man, is he got he got saved reading the book. He moved here, got baptized with us, and he just bought a house and is moving to town to be a part of the family. And so those are the kinds of things we hope and pray for when people read this. It's just an it's just another way to disciple people. So that's what excites me. He wears really awesome overalls too, Jess well, Peel. He is from Dylan. <laughs> um, okay, I should also mention that as we record this, the three of us, we just got back from Israel. So our spirituality is like <laughs> on 10. <laughs> so these are going to be extra exciting episodes, not to put any pressure on us. But um, it, it was incredible to be in Israel. And I want to start with the prologue because before we even dive into generally about the book, but in the prologue, you talk about your moment, your first moment of being at Golgotha where the crucifixion happened and then the empty tomb. And it was just so, it was to be there and see it myself because you read about it and you kind of get there, but then seeing it in person, it just really hits you like this tomb is empty still. (laughs) Yeah. And when you start with Golgotha, the place of the skull, one of the things I do on our trips is I make sure I take our church through the Church of the Holy Sepulchre first, which is where some people think the empty tomb was. Very few evangelicals buy into that because now it is the most ornate religious thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And then it seems to me, and it man, this smells a lot like the Lord, that he would preserve what is now called the garden tomb and that um, this engineer, archaeolo- archaeologist kind of guy is staying with Horatio Spafford, who wrote It Is Well With My Soul, looks out of his window, sees a, sees a hill with a skull in it, and says, that could be Golgotha. They raise some money, they purchase it, and just on the back side of that is a garden with a tomb in it, just like John 20 describes. Mm. And the first time I ever saw Golgotha, um, you know, every... Every picture that you see, like at the at the Christian bookstore, is on a hill far away with three crosses up high. But that's not how it would have gone. It would have been down, right outside of the gate on the way to Damascus, so people could come eyeball to eyeball with you. That space today is now a nasty bus stop, and of all the places it goes, it goes to Nablus, which is wh- which is like a hotbed for terrorism right now. Mm, wow, and um. And at first, you know, all of my, like, evangelical sensibilities were pretty offended until I began to realize, no, it's a pretty good depiction of what it would have been like. It would have been the busiest place where people would be coming and going and could see those who had been crushed by Rome and could thumb their nose at them. Mm. And then just on the other side of that is this beautiful garden with a wine press and and an empty tomb that is exactly as it's described in John 20 which is different than most of the other tombs because most of the tombs in the first century would have been more like catacombs. And this was a rich man's tomb that had never been used. And there were multiple like rooms carved out. And the only one, the only 
place where you could lay a body to the rest is the one that you would see catty corner if you duck down and look. And that's exactly what John describes. Mm. It's pretty incredible. And, you know, I think it's important to talk about this before we even dive into anything else, because you describe in chapter eight on the resurrection that this is the miracle of miracles. Everything else can fall into place. Everything else makes sense because of this truth. So Charles, I'd love to hear your first experience when you saw the empty tomb for the first time. Well, I think I was with you. Mm -hmm. um, Christy and I walked up and, um, and, and I, you know, I've studied both a little bit. Mark Croslin, if you're listening, you can correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong, but you know, there's the church, of the Holy Sepulchre, Sepulchre, and I can't even, I can never say that word, but you, we, we went there. I know I talked to people this last trip who say that absolutely that's where Jesus was crucified, dead, buried. And then we go to the, you know, the garden tomb just outside the city gates. And I, I do think it is just like God to sort of hold that in reserve. Mm -hmm. um, it does smell a whole lot. It smells a whole lot like him. Mm -hmm. Do I know? Can I say with certainty? No. And we say that in the prologue. I, 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 I wasn't there. I don't know. The good news is both of them are, are empty at this moment. Sure. <laughs> he is seated at the right hand of God. So I, I love that. When, we, when I walked up for the first time, I remember standing there and Mark Croslin was next to me and he pointed on the rock right just above kind of eye level and there's a something rusty embedded in the stone wall. And he said, this would have been the seal that the Romans placed behind the stone to keep it from rolling backward. And I always, always thought a seal was like, I don't know, like a big silicone gasket or something, <laughs> you know, they would have put, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing, but they sealed it to keep it from rolling back. And right. if you look closely enough, even today, and I checked when we were there, there is a spike that has been broken off yep. by God most high when he rolled that stone back. And so I don't know, I love walking in there. There are people who argue that it's, um, it's, actually a, it's actually a tomb carved in the style of a tomb from Hezekiah's time. So it's 700 years prior to Jesus-ish. But... Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. The tomb itself is dated to the first century. So there are people who think he just liked the style of Hezekiah's time, mm -hmm. but he carved it obviously in his day. So we do the same thing with our homes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I love it. I love walking in there. It's still empty. You know, it is the, it is the epicenter of, of, of us and our faith mm -hmm. and, if it's not empty, we well, let's just let's go do something else because our faith is useless. But the fact is that it is empty, and he did walk out shining like the sun. In fact, as our group was there, if you'll remember, there was a lot of emotion. There's a lot of people crying, <clears throat> which is fine. And then we all gathered together, and I'm like, "This ain't the crowd time, yeah. folks." <laughs> yeah. I just had to remind people. Um, I think that's what the angels are saying when they said, "Why are you crying?" Because right. yeah. they see this from a heavenly perspective. They're like, "We have been waiting on this day from eternity past until now. Mm -hmm. Like this is celebration time." Now, you can get overwhelmed with emotion and cry. I'm not saying that. I mean, I, I cry about happy things. Sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by the gospel. Mm -hmm. But but our our people gathered in a somber way, and although you're never supposed to tell people how to feel. I was like, you're, you guys aren't feeling right. <clears throat> and in the room when we were about to worship, the moment I said that, did y'all just feel like the lid totally. get lifted yeah. off yeah. Totally. And, and we just celebrated? And we sang, oh, praise his name. Yeah, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. Yeah. And we and, went, and which is right, right there. <laughs> I love it. And we sang that song louder than I've ever heard us yeah. sing. It was incredible. And then you were teaching, and we heard a group outside from a different country singing, oh, yeah. praise his name. And it was just such a beautiful picture of the church that we're all gathered in this place. That was by far the lightest sight, like the lightest I felt when you walked in because it's owned by a Christian ministry. There's so much religious tension throughout Israel <clears throat> that I didn't really know about or expect. And then the final day you walk into the garden where the garden tomb is and it just felt different. You know, our tour guide was like <laughs> preaching her face off to us. She was awesome. Which was so different than anything we had experienced. Christy and I that. had, let me interrupt you just for a second. Christy and I had, in between the two trips, we had some days to ourselves. And uh, we walked, we did what they call the ramparts walk, which is today you can go up and walk the walls around the old city of Jerusalem. It's like a 1.6 kilometers or something. 
And as we're walking on the northern, northern, northeastern side, so to speak, just outside the Damascus Gate, you 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 get to it, and Mark McCrossin stopped me, and he said, "This is the home, the orphanage, the whatever that the Spaffords bought after his girls died in the in the shipwreck and all that, and they moved to Jerusalem and moved their ministry there. They bought this building, which is right on the wall. So when you were talking about it in the prologue, yep. that, that like the, they're sitting up there having tea, and this guy looks down and I." Charles Gordon, I can't remember his name, right. something like that, looks down and says, that looks a whole lot like a skull. Well, when we got there on the Ramparts Walk, Mark stops me and he says, okay, that's the building. They're having tea there. Now turn around. And when I turned around, it made sense mm -hmm. because 80 yards right there is the Damascus Gate. Right in front of us, and there are pictures from the early 1900s, is an old road, obviously, leading out north towards Syria, Damascus. But in the pictures from the 1900s, it's filled with camels. It's a common everyday road out where they burn the trash. And right there, not 200 yards from the gate, is the skull. Hmm. And then 60 yards that way is a tomb. So when you're standing on the wall, it the geography makes Perfect mm -hmm. sense, especially when you know that from the Damascus Gate to Pilate's Praetorium, where he's flogged, is a three, four, five minute walk. So that, when standing up there, it, it made sense to me in a way that it had never made sense. <clears throat> and so, since everybody that buys the book can't hop on a plane and make it, this is what we were trying to do in the prologue: mm -hmm. is to um. Come with us to the empty tomb. Describe it in such a way that, man, just Google it a little bit and close your eyes and imagine that you can go there with us because it, it begins and ends right there, that our faith is built on an event, and the event was that Jesus, the Son of God, died in our place, was doornail dead for three days, and then was resurrected on the third day. In regards to Israel, and I think it's important to say you gave our group a, a caution on the first day that being in Israel, that there's nothing magic there, that our faith is not built on the rocks that we're going to see, the places we're going to see. And I think it's important for people to know that Israel, it, it, if you can go to Israel, you should. It's awesome. But there are so many religious people around the world that feel like they have to go to Israel to get close to whatever it is. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it, it, it for sure helps that what we're talking about and what we're talking about in each chapter of this book is a historical fact and event that happened. We're not talking about stories, mm -hmm. but we're also not chasing a feeling, you know, and we're not even chasing a miracle. Mm -hmm. We are chasing the miracle maker, the one who right. does it, you know? And so now you get this incredible promise of God in, in James chapter four, where he says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So I do believe God blesses those folks that show up there in an effort to try to deepen their relationship with him. Just like I think anybody that opens any kind of gospel centered book and their, their intention is to draw near to God, he will meet you there and draw near to you. Mm -hmm. But the point is not that I saw Peter's house or that I saw what the Sea of Galilee is. The point is that I would just lean into him and, mm -hmm. and try to abide in him. Totally. Well, let's dive into the book. So nine miracles, but that's less than the total amount that Jesus did. So why nine? How did you pick these nine? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> so, well, he does 37. Uh, 37 miracles give or take, but but that's genu generally what people agree on. I don't know. these um, The miracles that we talk about reveal God's heart for you. Mm. And I love the way John talks about miracles. He actually rarely ever, I don't think he ever uses the word miracle. He always calls it signs or signs and wonders because I think these particular miracles point to the character and nature of God. Now, maybe they all do, but there's just certain aspects of who God is and what he wants for his people that I think that you see here in these miracles. That's great. Now, sometimes some miracles listed, they just, I mean, they're so fast. It's like, and he healed many people, <laughs> you know? But but these in particular, I think, hit us right where we are. And the Bible says that he's the same yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. And so the 
And there's no expiration date on the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So I think the same kind of things that he wanted to do in and through and to the people that he saw in Galilee and in Jerusalem and all the places he went, he still wants to do those in and through and to us today. We just have to lean in by faith. So did you all have more miracles and you had to kind of do a little bracket style? Which miracles are we going to do? Honestly, he he came up with about nine or 10 of them and we just tried to figure out what could fit in a book that was accessible. <laughs> yeah. But also what got at the nature of God, mm. what reveals his person, character, love of and for us. And it, I mean, it, it's a, one of the things that's amazing and I'm gonna blow a little bit of snow here, but one of the things that's amazing to me about Joby is the quickness with which he can process vast amounts of information. Mm -hmm. And when we first sat down and started talking, and actually we started working on this book the moment we finished If the Tomb is Empty because it was a natural, mm -hmm. like we were we were there. It just made sense. It, you all see these as two separate books. We probably see it as one. Mm -hmm. And so we literally just turned the page, started working, and he just just out of his sort of memory, just spat off, well, let's do this one, this one, this one, this one, mm -hmm. this one. And I mean, I'd like to give myself a little credit, credit saying I thought of maybe one. I'm not even sure that's true. <laughs> I think he just said, here, let's do these. And I thought, wow, that's a really good idea. Let's do that. Yeah, I was going to ask, was the writing process the same for this one as it was the first go around with If the Tomb is Empty? I mean, I love it. I, it we, may be, we may be a little more efficient, you know, because... Um, kind of been dancing together now for mm -hmm. a couple of years, so things, but very, very similar. We went to our retreat center. We spend time in the woods. We go through the the content. Charles asked me about 100 questions. We cry. We pray. We, I mean. We're just doing our best to put the men back in menopause. <laughs> no doubt, man. <laughs> we are. We've said that so many times. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like a two-man disciple group. Yeah. Um, so but, good. you know, there's also uh, – um, there's one chapter on, so what do you do when you don't get your miracle? Right. Now, there is a miracle that we talk about, but it's that chapter is not primarily about the feeding of the 5,000. Mm. That chapter is primarily about what do you do when you don't understand God? Right. Then there's a whole chapter on how should we rightly respond to who God is and to the miraculous. <clears throat> that chapter is not even primarily about Lazarus coming out of the mm. grave. That chapter is primarily about our response to God in, in extravagant worship. Mm. And then there's also, um, you know, just over the past year, I've experienced both of those in, in the lives of two of my best buddies. Mm. And I'm sure at some point we'll talk about these, but I lost a best friend and then another best friend was healed. Um, and so we wanted to... I wanted to look at this holistically to make sure that people aren't chasing the gift, but the giver. Mm. And no matter what gift he gives you, whether he gives you success or suffering, that he's a good dad and he loves Amen. his kids. I love it. So before we dive into our chapter for today, um, you talk about in the prologue that it's a very important question. It's the same question that Pontius Pilate asked during Jesus's trial. What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And why do you open with that in the prologue? Why is that the lead in to the rest of the book? Well, first and foremost, it is the most important question that you will ever deal with in all eternity. And the answer, your answer to that question determines your destiny forever. Amen. So it's only the biggest thing ever. <laughs> but then I'm also a little cautious about a book on miracles that people are chasing the miracle as a like, what can you do for me? Mm -hmm. And Jesus is not a vending machine. He is the Savior, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And and whatever he does is for your good and for his glory, even and especially when we don't understand it. So we just want to establish it from the very beginning. This is not a how to get your miracle book. Right. This is the maker of miracles, and I want to just know him. You know, uh, Charles said it, Pastor Joby, you are— you operate in another category of planning. It's mind boggling how great you are at thinking ahead, being able to see how all the pieces line up. But we're in this year of the abundant life in this two year discipleship journey. And as you were 
praying through that journey for our church and this book is happening. I mean, to me, hearing you talk, I'm, I'm th- sitting here thinking, but that sounds exactly like our whole two-year discipleship journey on the on, cha- on pursuing the abundant life. Did those two things, did God just coincide those two things or how did those two things line up? Of course. And you, there's a really key caveat to what you just said about me being a great planner. When it comes to teaching the Bible and like <laughs> shepherding our people to a place, maybe maybe I have some gifts that God has given me there. And all the rest of my life, I am not a good planner. <laughs> <laughs> I just sort of have hazardly live my life and it works out okay. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, uh, the abundant life is knowing him abundantly and... You know the the prosperity gospel has been is, is such um, is such a heresy from the pit of hell, because and the heresy of the prosperity gospel is not that God doesn't want to prosper you, because He does. It's just we define prosperity just based on the temporary things. Mm-hmm. The true heresy of the prosperity gospel is is about preeminence because the prosperity gospel is this. If if I do my part, if I pray, if I sow seed, then you owe me health, wealth, and happiness. And in that equation, I am first. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, is that, that Jesus is before all things, Amen. that he is preeminent. Okay. But what many of us have done is that, man, we, we throw out the baby with the bathwater, and people don't believe that there's a good dad, and what father among you, if his kid asked him for a fish, would give him a scorpion. Mm-hmm. God wants to bless you. He wants to love you. He wants to answer your prayer request. He wants you to keep praying. He, Jesus wanted to heal people. I believe God wants to heal people. Now, that's not a blanket statement that every time we pray and show up to church, then we get healed, but it is that he is a healer. And he loves and he wants good things for his kids. That's good. So we just celebrated Easter. Uh, we just had the resurrection. We celebrated it again. The tomb is still empty. We were there. We saw. You made a comment before we hit record. Um, what did you say? We were in there more recently than Jesus was. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, which I just think is so good. So um, this we're kind of starting with the end because we're going chapter eight. We're not doing it in total order. We're going chapter eight, talk about the resurrection because we obviously had to do the resurrection chapter on Easter weekend. And then we're going to go back and move forward. But it it really is fitting because like we talked about a little bit earlier, everything hinges on the resurrection. So it's fitting to start with the end in mind that then as we go through all the other chapters, it all falls into place because the resurrection happened. Yeah, I am by nature and probably nurture a skeptic. I just am. And so when people come to me with their miracle stories, and man, I didn't grow up as charismatic as my dear brother over here, Charles. (laughs) And we joke sometimes, you know, he has joked about himself that uh, Christy says to him, you see a demon behind every bush. He goes, no, sometimes I see two. So that's just, (laughs) it's great, man. We've been good for each other too that way. Man, I, I, I didn't, I just, that has not been the way I was raised or whatever, okay? But what I have to remind myself when people are talking about or praying for the miraculous, like when I kneel down before God, our maker, and beg him to save Ben Williams, how, how can I believe that? And the, the way, what I, have to, what I have to hook my wagon to is not the amount of my faith. It's not the, the consistency of my prayer that what I hitch my wagon to is that, all right, if he's already pulled off the greatest miracle of all time, which that God came to earth and we killed him, and three days later, he walked out of the tomb. Well, if that is true, then surely I can believe for healing, for a restored marriage, for God to bless my finances, whatever the thing is that seems most pertinent at the time. And, you know, the... The example would be if you asked me for a billion dollars and I said, sure, here's a billion dollars and just freely gave it to you. And then you needed to borrow my car for a second. Wouldn't you have great confidence that if I was so generous that I could give you a billion dollars, then surely I'd let you take my truck down to the store? Well, sometimes we look at our little dinky circumstances and they don't feel dinky in the moment, okay? 
Like when your marriage is on the rocks, it, it don't feel dinky. It is, it is a moment of desperation. So why in the world could you believe God to heal your marriage? Because he breathed life into his dead son. Mm. And that, that's where the phrase, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible, came from. So this is about 300 pages of us just unpacking that idea. Mm. You can believe God for the miraculous because of God's faithfulness. So good. Here's nine examples. Particularly the empty tomb drives it all. Yeah. So in the story of, or the event of the crucifixion, resurrection, we have this character, Joseph of Arimathea. And Charles, I'd love to hear your thoughts. He's an interesting character in our narrative for me um, because he was a bit of a secret disciple. So why is he such a critical player in the entire narrative of our faith, really? I don't know. I think the heart, the Lord has a heart for secret disciples. And I, I'm, I wonder how many are, you know, hovering around us or maybe mm-hmm. sitting in church and I don't know, just the role that they play behind the King's throne kind of in silence or in, you know, I, I would imagine there are a lot that we do not know of, but I love, I love the picture of him going and asking for the body. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about that. He, he went to the authorities, said, Hey, I'd like to have his body. And then he and a couple of disciples, and I don't know who, went and pulled Jesus, like pulled his hands off the spikes. Mm-hmm. Somebody had to close his eyes. He's, in my, in my book, he's bloodless by the time. He's hamburger. The Roman scourge took care of pretty much everything on his back, neck, and sides. He's got a huge hole in his side. And here's this rich man. Probably doesn't come in contact with this all that often. And grabs his body. I don't know who who like cradled the body of Jesus. Mm. I don't know. But he, he played a part in that. And then he walks him, I think, because I, I, I believe in my way of thinking it's the garden to him. But again, I, then he walks him from that execution stick across what is now a bus stop into a place where they crush the grapes in a garden mm. and walks him inside a <laughs> walks him inside a tomb meant for himself. Mm. Mm. Think about that. He's laying the body of Jesus in a tomb meant for himself. If ever anybody understood you stood in my place and you took my right. stuff, maybe it was Joseph in that moment. Mm. So they hastily prepare the body. Sabbath is coming. And then with broken hearts, they roll the stone into place. I don't know. I I love the story of that man. Um, I've talked often about, I've been teaching the Bible professionally for 30 years. And um, let's just say I've read the Gospel of John before, right? (laughs) And for whatever reason, just as we were putting this together, the, when it says, uh, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. I don't know that I had a place in my discipleship categories for the secret disciple. Mm. And the Lord just said, man, you always got to make room for the secret disciple. Because that doesn't mean he's going to be secret forever. Mm-hmm. Just at this point in his journey, he's just not at the place where you are. Mm-hmm. Now, I fully believe he got there because obviously he is not ashamed of Jesus. He's spending like almost like his inheritance on him mm-hmm. and will be named as long as Christians name the name of Jesus. He's a part of the the retelling of the event that is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason I say it, because <clears throat> Nicodemus is also with him too. He was a kind of a secret disciple. And, you know, he shows up at night, mm-hmm. and now he's helping bury the body. And, I, you know, I think there are secret disciples. I think there are people that want to believe or are on the verge of believing or, um, you know, and they get this book, and it's kind of a secret. Like, they don't want it to fall out of their briefcase on the mm-hmm. plane so that everybody on their business trip sees it. And um, I, I would just encourage that person to just take one step at a time and do what the Lord is telling you to do. 
That's good. And if you feel like you're a secret disciple right now, just just keep leaning in because at the time, he will give you the boldness and the courage to step out in your faith and be and be the disciple that he's really calling you to be. You know what it kind of reminds me of is Mackenzie Wilson's life. Mm. She, well, maybe give a quick recap of her story for those. I mean, it's, she's a huge part of our church, but yeah. maybe there's some people who don't know it. Uh, uh, 15 year old girl starts showing up at our church. The coolest kid at her school. She had all the cool points. She's beautiful. She was an influencer of those kind of things. She gets saved. Um, at a sermon and writes in her Bible, I want to make my faith public. And then in the margin, and she wrote it over uh, Mark eleven twenty two, 22. And she writes, I want to make my faith public. And then under it, then begins to write the obstacles that she begins to perceive as a teenage girl in high school that she will have to overcome. And it was things like, what will my friends think about me? Mm -hmm. Some of those kind of things. Yeah, because, I mean, she showed up to youth group, I think, alone for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And so it was like she was almost, she was a secret disciple getting ready to share her faith, tragically taken from us Correct. at such a young age, so unexpected. But then God used her faith and what she was preparing for to bring tons of people to know him. And her legacy still lives on today. I mean, she, she, her legacy is a huge part of our church and who we are. And it's interesting. <clears throat> and, I mean, her, you know, her family was a very, very influential family in Jacksonville. Yeah. And um, Joseph of Arimathea, everybody doesn't just get to go to the authorities and be like, can I get the body? Right. Like, he and Nicodemus are leveraging the platform that God had given them right. to serve God. And so Blake and Steph... I mean, monster platform in Jacksonville and around, and they leveraged the success that God had given them to for significance for the good news of the gospel. This church wouldn't be here without that family. That's right. So good. Do you have something you want to add, Charles? No, I just was, when you started reading that, it says, so he, meaning Joseph, came and took away his body. And I just, I, I never really zeroed in on the fact that mm -hmm. it says he took his body. Mm. Yeah. And... It makes even more sense that the tomb is so close to where he was crucified because the dead weight of a 30-something-year-old man, I'm sure Jesus kind of built. So that's kind of heavy to have to carry a really far distance. So it kind of makes sense that he lived right next door. Yeah, yeah, the end of chapter 19 says, so because of the Jewish day of preparations, s preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, mm. they laid Jesus there. So good. So Joseph had great faith, but some of the disciples struggled a bit, kind of missed the resurrection, <laughs> which is both comforting, concerning and comforting mm -hmm. for us. But how did this happen? How did the disciples miss the resurrection? Man, when you get so focused on you. I mean, think about it. Uh, so one of the explicit places where Jesus, I mean, he just says, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priest, tried, crucified, dead, buried, and on the third day be resurrected from the grave. Matthew 20. The next, it's like period. <laughs> and the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus asking if her sons could sit on the right and the left. <laughs> right. When you are so consumed with yourself, I'm telling you, you don't have ears to hear what God mm -hmm. is, is saying to you, you know? Which, which should really inform the way we pray, by the way. Most of the time when we pray, we do all the talking and wondering why we don't hear from God. Well, he could very well be sending us a message, but if you're doing all the talking, you typically don't hear what he's saying. Mm. And they do it over and over and over. But they didn't have a cat. I mean, even post-resurrection, I think, they can look back through to the Old Testament and be like, oh my gosh. The, the Psalm 22 ends with him saying, one, talking about those who are born after us will live forever through him, and that he's going to say it has been done or it is finished. So post-resurrection with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then I think they can finally see that Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He is the one that was forsaken on the cross in Psalm 22. But up to this point, <clears throat> I'm convinced they think he's a leader like all the other leaders. Right. And and they were reading really an over-realized eschatology in places like Isaiah that talk about 
It's talking about heaven, and they were just waiting for him to come in, kick the Romans out, put mm. the Jews in their rightful place. They would be a superpower again, and all the weeds will turn to flowers. Mm. And so how does that relate to us these in current day as disciples, as followers of Jesus? I don't know that those folks had a box for Jesus and everything. We have the benefit of hindsight, and we have the benefit of the word, and we have the benefit of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. So we have a couple of things that in the moment, they didn't they didn't quite have. It's only after the resurrection that Jesus uses the scripture to reveal himself to them mm-hmm. through the, pro, the, the, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. So I, I think, it, you know, if, if I'm sitting in their seats and I'm listening to him talk about what's going to happen to him, it's probably going in one ear and out the other. Mm-hmm. I don't have a box or a context. I got I, I, nothing. We, on the other hand, kind of get the whole story all at once. So I don't, I don't know. I think they, I think they began to get their first glimpse of what he's talking about, about the time he says to tell us die. Mm-hmm. I think the moment he gives up his spirit, they're like, okay, maybe he's not going to take on Rome. Maybe there's something about this kingdom of heaven that I haven't quite laid a hold of yet. And I think they spend the next three days trying to wrestle with what exactly is he, is he talking about? And then Mary comes and tells him, they've taken away my Lord. And every single one of them runs to the tomb wanting, they, they want to see one thing. One thing is all they want to see, the body of Jesus. That's all, that's all they want. And then they get there and there are two angels sitting on either end sort of bookending the place where he laid, just like on the Ark of the Covenant, the angels stretched over the mercy seat. And they say, look, what do you, yo, dude, why you seek the living among the dead? You know, why? he's not here. He's risen. And I probably somewhere in there, the, 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 like if they were Apple computers, you'd see the spinning gear. <laughs> I think every single one of them started to go, hmm, something is amiss. Yeah, and they still don't get it because in John 21, Peter's like, I'm going fishing. <laughs> that does, It's not just a commentary on like, hey, it's a free Saturday. What are we going to do? <clears throat> it is, I used to be a fisherman. Nobody's going to pay me to follow the dead rabbi. And even the, even if he's back, what does that mean to us? Uh, so I'm going to return to my old way of life. Mm-hmm. And then Jesus reinstates Peter uh, on the shore there in Galilee. It's a beautiful picture of his grace, that his, mm-hmm. that his grace always outweighs your sin. Um, and even then, it's not until he shows up in the empty room, breathes on them, and then commissions them. All right, boys, you're going to be my you're going to be my witnesses everywhere. And then the Spirit of God falls on all the believers in Acts chapter 2, and it begins. Mm. And then they begin to realize, okay, now we get it. He is the lamb that was slain for the forgiveness of of anyone who would believe, and it is up to us to take that message everywhere. And then their faith is almost unshakable, I mean, even to death. And you say this all the time, that once you encounter the living God, once you encounter Jesus, then you can't turn away from it. And so it's almost like they had that moment when it all clicked, and then from there, their faith was never in question. So Peter takes us on such a roller coaster, you know, he's— all over the place. And then once Jesus forgives him, reinstates him, you know, then he's preaching at the yep. first church service and 3,000 are saved and baptized. You're exactly right. I mean, that's, <clears throat> I, I could no more deny Christ in my life than I could deny the sunrise. Mm-hmm. And C.S. Lewis says it. He says, it's not simply that I see the sun, it's I see everything by it. Mm-hmm. And that's Peter, man. So this is why he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin and says, you do whatever you think you got to do. But as for me, I cannot talk, I can't help but speak of what I've seen and heard. Now, this is the same guy that if I do the math, it would be 51, two days before this, can't even admit that he knows who Jesus is to a servant girl. So what's the difference? The difference is he had breakfast, a fish breakfast with the resurrected Christ and Jesus blew the spirit of God into him. Mm -hmm. And with that now, he's like, you do whatever you think you got to do. But I'm 
going to talk about what I have seen and heard. And what he saw is Peter was the first one to go into the tomb. And he is not there. He's alive. Mm, That's right. So, well, fish breakfast made me think about how in Israel, they love to serve fish for breakfast still to this day. And it is so gross. (laughs) (laughs) I sat next to someone who got it on the first day. I never sat next to them at breakfast again. Um, I want to talk about when Jesus breathes on his disciples. Uh-huh. I know you mentioned that you hadn't read that before, or you've read it, but it didn't stand out to you before. And so I want to talk about what that means that Jesus breathed on his disciples and how it parallels creation. Well, part of it, <clears throat> as as we're studying through this and working on it, it was like in the height of covid <laughs> and so, so I mean, extra a little more sensitive to people breathing on your face, you know. <laughs> and uh, and sometimes, you know, when I'm teaching and preaching, uh, I, I just want to put some flesh around what's happening. Have you ever considered, like, what was that one like? What, you know, did he do it birthday cake style? Like, everybody get together? And, <sighs> I don't think so. I think what's happening is um, he is taking the disciples back to the moment of creation mm-hmm. When God breathes into the nostrils of Adam, the very first man, the ruach of life, ruach can be translated breath or spirit Mm. or wind. And so this means that the very first human being opens his eyes and he is face to face with the living God. And that is imprinted upon his soul. Um, Bird scientists tell us that a part of what happens when a when a chick is coming out of the egg is particularly is true among turkeys, and I know this because it's spring gobbler season right now. You also <clears> love birds. We I do. This. I do love birds in general. <laughs> I love turkeys the most. That when they're coming, when they're hatching from their eggs, the mom will be right there, so that when the baby turkey, the poult is what it's called, when it sees its mom's face, that face is imprinted mm. upon that turkey's memory, and it'll follow that turkey or that mama. He knows. She knows. That's my mama. And I think, I love it when evolutionary biologists catch up with the truth of the scriptures. <laughs> that's right. And that's what happened at, at the creation, man. That moment, face-to-face with your creator, as your father in, a, in an unhindered relationship was imprinted upon the soul of every human being. Mm-hmm. This is what Ecclesiastes means when it says that eternity was put in our hearts. Sin separates that. Mm-hmm. That's what everybody's longing for. And for all of the old covenant, you didn't get face to face with him anymore. Even holy people like Moses, can I? I want show me your glory. He's like, it'll kill you. Can't do it. Now Jesus, the resurrected Christ, is in the upper room, walking through walls because they're afraid, and he says, "Peace be with you." And then, breathe the ruach of life, and and through the second Adam, who paid for the sin of the first Adam. We are the new Adam, created to be in that right relationship with God through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Mm, so good. I was listening to one of my favorite teachers yesterday. I just happened to be listening to this. Well, I didn't plan it, but Derek Prince was talking about this moment. And he studied Greek from the time he was a young boy. He taught it at a graduate level. So he's qualified to comment on the how words are used in the Greek. And he says that word, when it says he breathed on them, is the same word used in classical or secular Greek to describe what a flute player does when he presses his lips to the flute. So it was a very intimate, mm-hmm. intentional thing. So I think in that room, Jesus does the same thing that he did in creation and presses his lips to the disciples in whatever fashion, mm-hmm. however that happened. And I do believe that that, when he's making all things new, their next breath started in his lungs. Mm, that's so good. The disciples, the whole reaction from the resurrection, it's kind of messy. You have Thomas who he didn't know and he puts his hand in his side and then he believes and you got Peter. And so related to us now, what encouragement can you give to someone who they just feel like they're messy. They've messed up too much. Their life is messy. They have too many questions. They don't understand enough. What do they do? Um, it, it, you can make a really great disciple. <laughs> so the way I see 
John chapter 20 is that everybody brings their own humanity to the empty tomb, mm-hmm. and Jesus meets each of them right where they are. Like Mary's full of sorrow. I mean, how funny is John, the one who Jesus loves? He's full of his own <laughs> self. Like three times he has to oh, point out explicitly that he can outrun Peter. It's comical. <clears throat> Don't you think there's something going on there where like everybody's making a little much of Peter? Okay, I know he's the rock. And I know he professed Christ on the mountain of transfiguration, and I know he walked on water, but on land, I got him. Okay, right. so, but I get that, right? I mean, you think about Easter Sunday and who shows up. It's the same people that showed up on the very first Easter. Mm-hmm. Um, the guys on the road to Emmaus are like, did not, did not our hearts burn within us as he taught us the scripture? Again, Mary's crying, Thomas is doubting. Everybody brings themselves, Mm -hmm. and Jesus meets them exactly where they are. Like, he rebukes none of them. In fact, he doesn't even rebuke Thomas. Thomas says, I got to have proof, Mm -hmm. and he answers his request. He shows up and proves himself. So I think it's this incredible encouragement no matter where you are, whether you have doubts. Gosh, they doubted the resurrection, whether you have insecurities, ego, all kinds of emotion. You can't figure out the details of your life. Cool. Just bring it all to Jesus and lay it at his feet. Call him Lord and Savior. And then you have no idea what he might do with you. I mean, this is the possible part of anything is possible. Do you think Peter would have ever dreamed in a million years that it would be him that would give the very first Christian sermon on the planet, especially after all the times he got in trouble with his mouth. And God uses the very thing that he got in trouble with, and he blesses that thing and then uses it. And Peter is the primary leader of the disciples and leads 3,000 people to Christ on the very first sermon. And then their second gathering, 5,000 more. Mm. So if you don't like big church, you would have hated the first one. <laughs> right. It would have zero to 8,000 in like two Sundays. Yes. Charles, anything you would add? No, I think sometimes, and I've said this before, I think sometimes Thomas gets a bad rap because he just voiced his disbelief. But Scripture says none of them believed. Right. They're all sitting there in disbelief. He just happened to be (laughs) the the one that spoke up. And how cool, you're right, how cool is it that the Lord doesn't, you know, stick his finger in his chest or not. He walks up and says, hey, dude, you know, tickle my kidney or something (laughs) along that line, you know? (laughs) And 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 no. and Thomas does, and it's whatever he needed. The Lord, you know, when we get we 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 talk about him as you know, doubting Thomas. When we get to heaven, we will have to look him up, and you know, and the whatever the the heaven how we the directory, like you know, believing Thomas because that's what he does now. But none of them believe; they all doubt it. Even when he walks through locked doors. Hey, man, he Thomas is the one that before they head to Jerusalem, and the disciples are like hey, you can't go to Jerusalem or you're going to die, Jesus. And he goes, I'm going to Jerusalem. And Thomas steps up and he's like, let us go that we may lay our lives down with you. Right. So why doesn't he get the name Doubting Thomas? Probably John. (laughs) (laughs) John was feeling insecure. I think John was in school flannel graphs somewhere. Somebody had to come up with something, you know. It's it's funny because he really does have such bold... You know, we'll talk about it when we get to the woman with the issue of blood. But who named her that? Right. Right. I tell you, the church is famous for naming people for their missteps, their problems, their shortcomings. Jesus never calls her that. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Mm -hmm. never calls him Doubting Thomas. No, he he calls her daughter. No doubt. Right. I know. I can't wait to find out what her name is. I know. Right. So good. Okay. I want to read a quote that really touched me. It's on page 218. It's kind of long, so bear with me. You're wrapping up the chapter. This is right towards the end. So we've we've talked through the resurrection and it says, will you bring all your unbelief, fall on your face and believe in? If you've made it this far, then you're probably desperate and need a miracle. Despite the fact that your newsfeed, your biology class and all our modern and postmodern ideologies tell us we're crazy to believe in miracles, you're here. All of us have a tendency to say, I know he can heal everybody else's marriage, but maybe not mine. I heard that maybe he's healed somebody else's cancer, but maybe not mine. I've heard stories that he may have broken the chains of addiction for somebody else, but maybe not mine. Maybe it's pornography. It's an eating disorder. It's why do I care so much about what Instagram says about me? What is the miracle you need? Name it, write it out. Don't be afraid. 
it even like makes me tear up reading it right now because I've prayed for people in our church who for years they have been looking for a miracle and they think it's not here for me. And um, I just want to spend some time talking to those people who are sitting here and they're saying, yeah, I read the Bible and I believe and I'm inspired by the disciples' faith, but I just don't think I'm part of the one who's going to get the miracle. First of all, I would I would want to put it in perspective that the only eternal miracle is salvation. It's like Lazarus dies again. Hmm. The blind man, his eyes don't work. I mean, eternally when he gets to heaven, but <clears throat> the only eternal miracle is salvation, even the ones that we've experienced. I prayed for Ben Williams. He's he's healed, man. He's going to die one day. Matt Chandler, who writes the forward hmm. and, and shares some of his story about being healed from cancer, there will be... Save Jesus returning, he too will die one day. The only eternal miracle is salvation. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, before you go seeking any temporary miracle, would you please surrender your life to the Lordship of yeah. Jesus Christ? And then one day, there is no pain. Nobody in heaven walks with a swagger or a limb. Mm. However, <clears throat> the reason that you can believe that God is for you is because of the cross, He has demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And if he won't even, if he wouldn't withhold his own son, then how much more does he have for us? And again, if he can breathe life into his dead son and he walks out of the tomb, then surely, surely he can breathe into you whatever you need to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Mm. Jesus Christ. That's good. We have a tendency to, and I'm guilty of this. I'm not pointing. I mean, if I'm pointing a finger at anybody right now, there are three pointed back at me. So we have a tendency as people to develop a theology based on our experience. And uh, I tried God once and he let me down. And from there, we build a theology of his person. Scripture would, would encourage us and Jesus would encourage us to not try and build our belief system upon our experiences, but upon his word. And one of the beautiful things that we see in this woman who once had the issue of blood is that she believed his promises more than her condition. Mm-hmm. And that's why she elbows her way through the crowd. She had every reason in the world. She had 12 years of nonstop chronic anemia. She's ble- I mean, there's diapers in her backyard. Mm-hmm. She's, she's a mess. But for some reason, because Malachi said the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings or his kanaf, and Jesus shows up wearing a shirt with four corners, she elbows her way through because his word is true, more true than her. And I'm not doubting her circumstances. I'm not doubting any of our circumstances. Lord knows I have prayed for a lot of people who are either with Jesus right now or have not been healed. I mean, I have my... If, if, if you want to say, well, give me the list, Charles, I can tell you the places where my heart hurts to where he didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted it answered. But that doesn't mean he's any less than, than who scripture says he is. So the, the, where the rubber meets the road for us, for me, for, for all of us, what do we actually believe? What are we pestuoing in? Is it his word or is it, our experience outside. And that's where the enemy loves to just beat our head against whatever to, to wear us down. He, well, did he say this? Did he, he doesn't love you. He let you, all of that. They're all lies from the pit. When it, this is the kind of people the Lord is looking for. And I pray that by the grace of God, we become these people mm. that when it is painfully tough and difficult, that his word is true, mm. Period. End of story. There's no debate, no argument. Job says, I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you and I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job heard and knew a lot about him, but then he had a revelation into who God is and he met him. Mm. I'm praying that we do the same thing in his word. I'm praying that people find that in this book. That's good. And God would never give you a thing that would drive a wedge between you and him. Mm. Why would he? What good father would do that? And so don't ever expect God to fuel your idolatry. And if you use him as a means to an end, he won't play that game. Mm. And, and yet he says you have not because you ask not. And then James says you ask with the wrong motives, that you can spend it all on you. Mm. 
And so if you are the center and the superstar of your own story, there's a real problem there. And a part of what we're trying to do here is that you would you would bring it to the empty tomb. You would lay it at the foot of the cross because there's all kind of prayers that don't get answered in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I mean, man, you want to talk about if somebody has the gift of healing, he's got a whole list of people that he, I mean, he talks to Timothy, he can't heal his, his mm -hmm. whatever stomach issue he has, right? <clears throat> and he comes three times before the Lord. He says, will you remove, and I don't think that means he prayed three times, like one, two, three, I'm done, no. I think this means like three seasons of intense, mm -hmm. probably fasting and prayer. Yeah. Would you please remove this thorn from my flesh? Mm -hmm. And when you read in Corinthians, you actually find out it was, how about this one? It was a demon given by God. So God's handing out demons. Put that in your theology pipe and smoke it. I don't have a category for that. I don't know what to do with it. That's just what the words say. And yet he eventually allows Paul to see it was a gift to him to keep him from being prideful. Mm -hmm. It's so good. It's such a good challenge. I mean, what you said, I think, is so key that God's never going to give us something that would drive a wedge between us and him. Um, and I would encourage everyone as you're praying through this, 1122 recently released a song called Maker of Miracles. And it was written by our worship leaders, Lindsay and Austin, years ago when they were in the middle of a battle with infertility. Mm -hmm. And I mean, seven years they prayed for a baby and now they have a baby, a total miracle. But they wrote this song in a place of not seeing a miracle. And the whole song is maker of miracles, God of impossibles, like reinforcing that he is still who he says he is. And so it's just a really beautiful picture that goes along with that. That, And I would also say, man, you got to let yourself off the mat a little bit. God can handle your prayers. Read the Psalms. Yeah. Like before Jesus ever quotes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David is in a point of prayer and he says... What are you doing? You're leaving me alone, abandoning me. And the Spirit of God is like, that's good. Let's keep that in the book mm -hmm. forever. So you can bring it to him with all intensity. Yeah. You just got to love and trust him more even than you love whatever answer you get. Sure, yeah. Think mm -hmm. about this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus comes back three times and asks the same question. Right. Maybe he didn't like the answer the first two times. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't until the third time where he was like, all right, your will, not mine. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, well, in closing, week one in the books, we have eight more weeks to go. I would just love to hear, what is your hope for our people throughout this series, this book, this podcast, all the things that we're doing? What's our hope for our people? People that don't know him would discover him. And people that do would know him better. Mm. Always our mission, discover and deepen. That's it. Just doing the same thing. Charles, will you pray for us? I will. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We thank you that the tomb is empty. We, we, were there, we were there more recently than you and we checked and you're still not there and we're grateful for that. Father, we, we give you these weeks ahead of us and we ask that you would give us the words to speak to encourage your children and that you would love on them and um, this would be a, a salve to their hearts and wounds and doubts and beliefs and all the above. Father, would you bring... Would you bring your children to yourself through this? Would you use it as, um, would you use these words to, to, to help folks discover you or to lead them to a place that they discover you? And then that for those that have, they would deepen in their walk and in their belief and in their faith with you. Lord, we give you this time. We thank you for allowing us to, to have the freedom to do this. And we pray, pray all of this in the matchless name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the podcast. <laughs> the end. You nailed it.